Um, okay, so we're just continuing on that topic of um, knowing that you're saved and what the evidence, you know, the title is called Evidence of Salvation, but we've been talking mostly about the evidence of faith because we established that, you know, we want to be saved. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, so that's how we know we, we're saved because we believe. And then we started exploring the question, well, if I just need to believe to know that I'm saved, well, then how do I know I believe? And the question sort of goes to that. And we talked about a couple of ways people try and determine the existence of their faith and why they're bad ways. So we've covered so far, you know, your circumstances, you know, the circumstances surrounding how you came to believe. And then we talked a bit about your feelings, how you felt either before um, you were saved or how you even feel after you're saved doesn't change whether or not you believe or not. And the last one we talked about was desires, like what desires you have after you're saved, because people will say, well, if I truly believe, why do I still have such a desire to sin? And we sort of covered that because we have a flesh nature and we have a, a spirit nature and they are war against each other. So it's a bit silly to base the existence of your faith uh, whether or not you have good feelings or bad feelings or good desires or bad desires because as believers we have both. So you, you'll have bouts of thinking you have faith and not thinking you have faith depending on um, uh, where you are in your walk. Uh, and So it's a bad way to determine if your faith really exists because it's not really a sure way to know. And the last one I just wanted to cover today which is really the biggest one is uh, works. Works are not a way to determine whether or not your faith exists. So we don't determine the existence of our faith uh, by works. Now, why are our works a bad way to base whether or not our faith, is on, our faith on Jesus Christ exists? Well, it's the same with desires, right? Because we have good desires and we have bad desires, we have a spirit and a flesh. Uh, the same reason why it would be bad to base whether or not we have faith on whether or not we have good works or whether or not we sin because we do both as believers. Um, and I'll just go back there again just to, to recap, but let's go back to Galatians 5 and just see that verse. So this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So we have a spirit and we have a flesh. So when we are born again, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our spirit is born of God. So we have that desire, the spirit desire, to want to do what's right. But we still have the sinful flesh that we're living in. And we have two natures there. So, and this is the reason why we still sin, because the desire to sin is still there. And because it's still there, we, we do sin. That's the reason why we sin when we walk in the flesh. So because we do both, it's, it's, not, very, it's not a very good way to determine whether or not we believe because if we're walking in the flesh and we're basing our faith whether or not we have good works or not, well, at that point in time, you might not think you have the faith because that, if that's what you're basing it on. So there's this concept in the Word of God of the spirit and the flesh. Um, but in Ephesians 4, we'll just see here as well, we see uh, the new man and the old man. Um, we'll just see there in Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work or uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now we saw there in Galatians 5 that we're commanded to walk in the spirit, we're commanded to put on the new man. So, you know, there's a thought out there amongst a lot of Christians that if you get saved, you will automatically do what's right. There will automatically be some change. Well, if it was automatic, why would we need it to be commanded to walk in the Spirit? Why would we need to be commanded to put on the new man? And some people have trouble understanding, well, how can somebody believe 
and there be no change. Well, this analogy of putting on the new man and uh, putting off the old man works really well to understand why somebody can be saved, why they can believe, and yet you as, as man cannot see any change in their life. Because if we see the way the old man and the new man is described here, it's almost like putting on a new change of clothes. We put off, let's say you own two coats, you put off one coat and you put on the other coat. Now, if somebody gives me a coat as a gift and I receive that coat and then I put it in my cupboard, if I never wear that coat, you're never going to see that coat, are you? But it, does that mean I don't own the coat? Does that mean I didn't receive the coat? If, if they give me a coat saying, well, you have to wear it, otherwise you're not going to get it, I mean, that's sort of a condition attached to that gift because a gift should be unconditional. It should be given to me whether or not I wear the coat or not. So if I have a coat, if I put it on, then you'll be able to see that new coat that I've been given. And it's the same with the old man and the new man. We have the old man, which is visible. But when we, when we are saved, when we are born again, we have the new man, which is this new creature, the spirit that's born of God. But if we do not put on Christ, if we do not put on the new man, then that new man will not come out and, and, and show itself to the world. But it doesn't mean the new man doesn't exist. And that's why works is a bad way to determine whether or not faith exists because somebody can have their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, be walking in the flesh, and you not even see this new man. I mean, they may not even be, they can, they can almost, uh, you know, uh, what's the word, like uh, numb their conscience or not, uh, you know, quench the spirit, the Bible says, um, this desire that's in them, if they continue to walk in the flesh, but I do believe they will experience the chastisement of God to get them back on track. So there is this new man and, and this old man. And this is what the new creature is talking about. This is one verse that a lot of people go to to sort of show that... Um, If you're saved, there will be some change. Uh, this is one that we hear a lot, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. So people will read that verse and they'll say, see, if any man be in Christ, you're a new creature. So, so that's why if you believe on Jesus Christ, things are going to be new, things are going to change, you're not going to be the same person as you were before. But is this verse actually saying that the Christian as a whole, both body, soul, and spirit, will, is, is this is what this verse is teaching. Because if we read the whole verse, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So that little phrase there on the end, it says, Behold, all things are become new. Is this verse talking about the Christian as a whole? Well, it can't be. Because we still sin, not all things are new. So some things are still old, so we need to understand why are some things still old? Because we still have the, we have the spirit, but we also have the flesh. And what this verse is referring to is that new creature, is that new man that is born of God that cannot sin. And we'll see some of those verses as we uh, continue today. So the, the big question really is, um, if works are the evidence of faith, then how much works do I need to have before I'm sure my faith exists? Because if I'm trying to judge whether or not I have faith based on the amount of works I have, well then the next logical question is, well, how much works do I need to have in order for that to prove that my faith is there? If that's the way I'm going to try and prove that my faith exists or prove to myself that my faith exists. So we can see here in this verse, if we were to ask that question, well, it's saying all things are become new. So this verse is not going to act as a, a, pro like a proving to me that works is an evidence of my faith because then it would only prove to me that I don't have faith because not all things are new. So you see how they, they turn to verses to sort of uh, support, you know, if you have works, you're saved. But what we're going to see as we go through a couple of these common verses is that not, these verses would not actually... Uh, I guess ensure that your faith is there, but it would actually condemn you for not having enough works to prove that your faith is there. Um, let's look at this verse in James, because I just want to give you a principle here. Because when we talk about work salvation, the standard in work salvation is 
keeping all the law, isn't it? And we read here in James 2 verse 8, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So we know Romans 3.23 says, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the standard when it comes to work salvation is sinless, perfection. You know, you have to keep all the works. And the question I sort of ask, well, if that's the standard before you get saved, because well, people will say, well, you, you know, you, you, yeah, okay, the, the standard for salvation is, is keeping all the law. But, you know, you've got to divide between, you know, what comes before salvation and what comes after salvation. But then, you know, I think to myself, well, if the standard of works is perfection, why would that standard then change after salvation? You know, why would it, why would it be, okay, you have to keep all the law in order to be saved, but once you're saved, now you can use works as a standard a lower standard than perfection. How does that even make sense? How does the standard of works change from before salvation and after salvation? I don't know whether I'm making sense there. You know, they say, well, this is what you have to do to know that you're saved, but, but this is the standard of works that you need to know that you're, you're right with God and that you have um, eternal life. Why, why would that standard be different depending on whether you're before salvation or after, after salvation? I mean, you have to keep the works of the Lord to have these blessings and this, um, this thing apply to you. Uh, so... We see there in James that if you offend in one point, you've come short, you've, you've sinned and you've come short of the glory of God. And why would that standard change before and after salvation? You know, and this is what happens when people base uh, anything on works. Because when you base anything on works, what happens when people do that is they set an arbitrary bar. Because in the Bible, when you see a standard of works, it's always keeping all the works of the law. So if you are going to sort of justify anything by works, you would have to then set the bar low enough so that you get over it. Because you're not going to set a standard that condemns yourself. I mean, if you say, well, you know, to, to show that you have faith and that you're saved, you have to be in church. I mean, if you're not in church, you're not going to have that standard. You're going to have some other standard, like reading your Bible or something like that. So, and, and for, for those of us, you know, even amongst our circle, you know, and that try to show that, you know, the evidence of faith or the evidence that you're saved is by some kind of works, they're just setting that bar a little bit higher than everyone else. They just make it soul winning, reading your Bible, prayer. But, you know, what about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength? What about, you know, loving your neighbour as yourself, which, you know, none of us do perfectly. How could we possibly uh, set a standard of works in order to show whether or not we believe? So, you know, those that sort of say, well, there's got to be a, a, a you know, they'll say, well, if you're really saved, there'll be a change in your lifestyle. And you hear that preached in churches. And generally, you know, people will say amen in church because they're the ones that have changed their lifestyle. They're in church and they've made a change. So then they're like, yeah, like I've made a change. I know that I'm saved. But then, you know, what about the people that don't feel that they've changed? You know, they, they're sort of, um, you know, made to look to their works for, um, for, for assurance. But it really just depends on your humility because I think, you know, all of us have sin in our life and it really is just making you think, well, are you focusing on the works in your life or are you focusing on the sin? Because if you focus on the sin in your life, you may start to think, well, I'm not actually doing the works that I should be doing in order to have this assurance that everyone talks about when it comes to, you know, assuring your faith or assuring your salvation by works. So, I wanted to just go over some common verses and I hope I don't take up too much time because there's a couple of verses I really wanted to touch on. You know, common verses that people try and use in order to uh, promote that works are an evidence of faith. And when we think of this topic, you know, the major one and probably the one I'm going to spend the most time on is James chapter 2. So James chapter 2, um, you know, this common and popular used phrase, you know, faith without works is dead. And, you know, what do they try and make James to mean? Well, they say, you know, well, faith without works is dead. So one thing they might try and say is, you know, well, faith and works are inseparable. So that's why, you know, if you have the faith, you're going to have the works because they always come hand in hand. And that's why the Bible says faith without works is dead, because if you don't have works, then you don't really have faith. Well, 
how does that even make sense with James? Because if James chapter 2, if we just uh, read one of them quickly, uh, it says here, verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now if faith and works always come hand in hand, how can that statement even make sense? Because how, how, how is a dead faith e even possible? Because if it says, you know, faith without works is dead, but if you have faith, you always have works, then, then how is this dead even possible? So that doesn't make sense if faith and works are inseparable. So instead they might say, well, there's actually two types of faith. And they say, well, then there's a, a dead faith, uh, or, or the fact that, or they might say you have no faith, or a dead faith, a faith that has no works. And then there's this saving faith, a faith that has works. Um, and then they basically define it as two types of, of faith. And they might say something like, you're not saved by works, but you're saved by faith that works. Now that doesn't help somebody that is trying to determine whether or not they have faith, because it just pushes the problem one step further away. You know, it's like in, in, in any business, they say you're cook, kicking the can further down the road. So, because if we're trying to determine whether or not we have faith, but the only way, you know, or we're trying to determine whether or not we believe, and you determine whether or not you believe by whether you have faith, but then you're trying to determine whether you have faith by whether you have works. I mean, now you're just back to square one where you're trying to see whether I have enough works and we all come short. We've all offended in one point. We're all guilty of all. It's not really going to help us when we're trying to determine whether or not we're saved. And this is why it's one a bad way of determining whether we are saved. Now, why does this... Um, this interpretation of James 2 not fit what we see in the Bible in terms of, you know, you have a, a faith, one type of faith without works that does not save, and then having one, another type of faith that does have works that does save. Um, well, let's look at this uh, passage in Romans 4. Because it doesn't actually fit with what we see in Romans 4. Uh, let's read from verse 5. But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So we see here a passage where somebody, it's a faith that doesn't have works. It's a faith where if you work not, but believe on him that justifieth the ungodly, your faith is counted for righteousness. And we see here that David describes the blessedness of the man under whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So if we take the interpretation of James to say, well, there's a dead faith that doesn't save, that doesn't have works, and there's a faith that has works, and that's the faith that saves, well, how does that line up with Romans 4, where Romans 4 is telling us that there is a type of faith that doesn't have works, and this is the faith that saves. So if that's the faith that saves, that means a dead faith can save you because it's faith on Jesus Christ. That's what counts for righteousness. So it doesn't fit with uh, Romans 4. And just going back, you know, I, I want you to, to sort of keep in the back of your mind as we go through these verses. If, if somebody's going to use these verses to try and prove that they have faith or prove that they have salvation, every time you read these verses, you need to ask yourself, well, how much works do I need in order for that, con that condition that I've set by this verse to apply to me? Because let's say, for example, you believe that faith without works is dead and dead meaning, um, well, they, they'll say dead meaning you don't have salvation. So we've showed in Romans 4 that you can believe and not have works, but you have salvation. So dead can't mean you can't have salvation. But also faith without works is dead, meaning I don't have salvation if my faith doesn't have works. Isn't the next logical question, well, how much works do I need to have to have this saving faith? Because am I just going to set an arbitrary bar and say, well, I've got this amount of works, therefore my faith is living, therefore my faith is saving, and I am saved. But where did you get this standard from? Where did you get this standard of this arbitrary level of works in order to determine that your faith was alive, that your faith was saving in order for you to then have salvation? So what then does this uh, dead faith mean? So well, let's go back to James 2 and let's just go through it really quickly. 
and we'll get an understanding of what it actually means. And you'll see that it's it, it, just throughout that whole scripture passage from 14 to the end, it's talking about faith in the eyes of, of man, how man can see your faith. Verse 14, what doth it profit, my brethren? To what benefit is there? Like, you know, a profit in a business is when your you know, income exceeds your expenses. So you make a gain. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, two things to note in that verse is it's a question. It's not a statement. So it doesn't say faith, this faith does not save him. It's just asking, can faith save him? So we could answer that question with, well, yes. You know, even if he has faith and has, doesn't have works, can faith save him? Yes. Um, I mean, two ways to think about this verse as well is, is it talking about spiritual saving or is it talking about physical saving? Because you can interpret it both ways. You know, can faith save him spiritually? Well, yes. But can faith save him physically? Well, maybe not. And it could possibly mean that more so than saving him spiritually. Why? Because as we read on, you'll see. So it says, what gain is it? Though man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? Spiritually, of course, Romans 4 says, if he believes and has no works, his faith is counted for righteousness. But it could mean, you know, can faith save him physically? Meaning, can it profit him at all in the physical sense? Well, maybe not. Because if we read in verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. So we see here, now the context is this physical uh, food and keeping yourself alive. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So again we see the, 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 the physical aspect, but not only that, this verse is saying if somebody is hungry and you don't give them any food, what does, how is your faith going to benefit them at all? So we see still this, the direction of which we're showing this faith. It's still between man and man, isn't it? Because it's saying, well, how does your faith profit this other man if you say, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. So it's not saying, does it profit you in that sense? It's saying, what does it profit that other person, that other man? And it's not even talking about showing your faith to God. Even so... If it hath not work, oh, faith, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now note, it says here, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So what is dead in that scripture? Well, it's the faith, isn't it? It's not the Christian. It's not the Christian that's dead. It's the faith that is dead. Because a believer can have a dead faith and still be saved. It's just not going to profit anybody. So it's the faith that is dead. I know some people will say, well, you know, if your faith doesn't have works, then you don't really have faith. But that doesn't even make sense in the analogy of faith without works is dead because just because something is dead doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, I could have a dead dog on the ground, but does that mean that that dog doesn't exist? Um, dead, I think here means it doesn't, it, it doesn't profit anything. It doesn't bring forth any life. And I can, I can show you a passage in the Bible where it actually uses this word dead to, to mean that. Uh, let me show you here in uh, Romans 4.19. And this is still talking about Abraham. I just want to touch on here and we'll come back to Romans 4. But look at this verse in verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So Abraham wasn't dead in the sense that he didn't have any life. He, he wasn't alive. It's saying that his body was not able to bring forth any life. And, and also Sarah, her womb, because she was barren, the Bible describes it as the deadness of Sarah's womb. So something being dead doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means it, it, it can't bring forth life. It, it's dead. It doesn't have any life and it's not going to, to profit anybody. So that's one way we can think of, of, of dead. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. So, you know, there are two, a couple of ways you can interpret that verse. You can say that, well, it's not really James saying that he's going to show people his, his works by his faith. 
Um, it's just somebody might say that. Um, I personally think that you do show other people your faith by your works because that's the only way you can show them your faith is by your works. So even if it's not James saying that, the principle is still there that you know somebody might have faith and have works, but we ought to show our faith to them by our works. And we'll see that principle in Titus a bit later on. So there's nothing wrong with that passage there to say, yeah, well, that's how we do show our faith to other people. But it's still not talking about salvation. It's still not talking about showing your faith to God. It's still a side words evidence of one man to another. This is how you show your faith to somebody else. You show it by works because they can't see your faith. Um, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now this is another verse where people will say, look, see, even the devils believe, so you can believe, but if you don't have works, I mean, you just have the sort of faith that devils have, and they're not saved, therefore how can you be saved if you just believe and you act like a devil, or you act like, um, you, you do the works of a devil? Um, well, first of all, this, is not, this is verse is not saying that, we, that, the, that they believe on Jesus Christ, which is what it takes to be saved. It just says, thou believest that there is one God. Now, the Muslims believe that there is one God, but they're not saved, are they? So you can believe that there's one God and not be saved. But even if this is talking about having faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, and part of that is believing that there's one God, and it says, Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. If we read that verse in the context of what the whole chapter is talking about, which is being profitable to other people, it's still saying, well, even if you believe, if you act like a devil, I mean, it's not going to help anybody else. But not only that, is, you know, Jesus Christ, he did not even die for devils. You know, he did not die in the likeness of devils. So even if devils did believe on Jesus Christ, they couldn't be saved anyway. So there's a lot of ways that you can, you can interpret that verse and not to mean that you need to have works in order to have faith. So they believe that there is one God. Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But they're not believing on Jesus Christ, they're just believing that there's one God. Verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So he just re reiterates that truth, that faith without works is dead. And we believe faith without works is dead, because if you have a faith and you don't have works, your faith is dead. We need a living faith in order to be profitable to other people. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou? So I've already noted this to you guys before, but again you see the, the fact that other men are seeing your faith. He says, seest thou how faith wrought with his works? So you saw Abraham's faith when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. That's what that's saying there. So when, I, when Abraham offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seest thou, you saw his faith. You, thou, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, so again, you seeing the faith of Abraham, Ye see then how that works, that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So I sort of alluded to that already, where you, know, you can have a body without a spirit, it's dead, but it doesn't mean the body doesn't exist. The body is there, and in this, I guess in this... Um, analogy, the body being the faith and the spirit being works, well, even if faith doesn't have works, faith still can exist. It's just dead, just like a body without the spirit is dead. Now, let's just go back to verse 24. It says here, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Because somebody might take that verse and say, whoa, hey, look, justification, right? Well, it, we have to have works with our faith because that's how we're saved. That's how we get justified. Well, is that what verse 24 is talking about? No, because verse 24 in this whole context is talking about your faith profiting other men. So what does it mean here when it says your works, you're justified by works and not by faith only? I believe it's that your faith is made evident. It's justified in the eyes of man 
by works, which is the context that we see in this whole passage. Now let's just jump to Romans 4 and just compare it with what we see here, because this really is the parallel passage to show you that James 2 is talking about your faith in the eyes of other men, but Romans 4 talks about your faith in the eyes of God. And we can prove this with the example of Abraham, which is the common example between the two chapters. Let's read from verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So he's justified by works in the eyes of man. You see, because it's saying here, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. So who is he glorying before? Before man, right? Because it says, but not before God. So he doesn't glory before God by his works. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now look at this. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? So it's saying, uh, is this blessedness that the Bible is talking about, is it only unto those that are circumcised? Or in uncircumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So it's saying this blessing came on them not because they got circumcised, but they got this blessing when they were not circumcised. Uh, sorry, did I skip something there? Come with this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also, verse 9. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So what is this verse saying here in Romans 4? It's saying here that Abraham, which is the common example between James 2 and Romans 4, he was not justified in circumcision, meaning he wasn't justified and saved after he was circumcised. He was actually saved prior to when he was circumcised. So if we actually look into Genesis, we can actually see when Abraham was, I guess, in this sense, justified before circumcision. Because remember, if we go just quickly back to James 2, we read here in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So James 2 is saying there, well, he was justified when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. But Romans 4 is saying he's justified prior to when he was circumcised. So these are two different timescales here. And we've, if we look in Genesis, we can actually prove that James 2 is talking about faith in the eyes of man. And Romans 4 is talking about faith in the eyes of God. Because we can prove here that... Abraham was justified many years before uh, he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Look here, in Genesis chapter 12, we see here when um, Abraham was initially called out um, of uh, the land of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. Uh, in verse 12 here, let's just read, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now if we read in Galatians, this is actually a shadow of the gospel, the blessing of Abraham coming onto him by faith. And it says here, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. 
So in Genesis 12, we see Abraham is 75 years old, and that's when he's called to leave his land and go into a land that God will show him. Now Genesis 15 is where we see this passage that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So verse 15, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? <clears throat> and Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this is the event that both James and Romans refer to when it says Abraham believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. It was a promise from God saying, you know, you will bear a son and that's the son that will be, um, you know, the, the heir that will, will receive the blessing. So did Abraham get saved in Genesis 12 when he called upon the Lord and he was called out or did he get saved here in Genesis 15 when he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness? You know, maybe you can make a stronger case that this is when he got saved, if, if, if Romans 4 is saying that's when he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Um, but, you know, he could, he could have got saved in Genesis 12, you know, when he called upon the Lord. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. But either way, that's not going to matter in a second. So Genesis 12, he's called, he calls upon the Lord and he's called out of uh, the land of Haran. And he, uh, he's 75 years old. We see here in Genesis 15, the account of when he's given the promise from God and he believes on God and it's counted for him for righteousness. The next chapter over, we see here in Genesis 16, I'm not, just, I'm not going to read it all for the sake of time, but Genesis 16 is when Sarah says to Abraham, or maybe it, the way we're going to have children is if you, know, you sleep with my servant Hagar, and then Hagar will give birth, and then that will be, you know, how God will uh, bless our seed. And then there's that whole story about, um, you know, what he does there. But I just wanted to show you in, in um, chapter 16 the age of Abraham when this happens. So, and Hagar bare Abraham a son, and Abraham called his son's name, which, bear, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. So we know then that, you know, that Abraham was at least 86 years old when he was saved. Because he got saved prior to when he was 86 years old. Because 86 years old is when um, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. But remember, he called upon the Lord in Genesis 12, you know, way before it, it, when he was 75. So did he get saved there? Even if you say he didn't, got, get, didn't get saved there, well, in Genesis 15, when God gave him the promise and then he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, he, was, he had not reached 86 years old yet because it was Genesis 16 that then Sarah takes things into her own hands, gets Abraham to sleep with Hagar, and then Ishmael is born. He's 86 years old. Well, let's look at Genesis 17. Genesis 17, it says here, And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine. So how old is Abraham now? He's 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham but, uh, Abraham, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now let's just go on um, just to get to the um, covenant. Verse 10. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and, your, and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, 
He that is born in the house or bought with money or of any stranger which is not of thy seed. So I won't read it all for sake of time, but Genesis 17 is then when we read about the covenant that God makes with Abraham of circumcision. Now, remember in Romans 4, we read that Abraham was already saved in uncircumcision. So he's 99 when he's given the covenant of circumcision, but he was saved many years before that. In fact, at least, you know, what's 86 minus 99 minus 86? At least 13 years? Because Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13 years old. Abraham was 99 years old, we read later on, when, when he was circumcised. So at least 13 years, Abraham has been saved. Maybe even longer, if you go back to when he was 75, when he called upon the Lord and he was uh, called out of the land of the Chaldeans. So at least 13 years have passed, Abraham has been saved. Now he's given the covenant. Genesis 21, oh, I won't turn there, but Genesis 21, we see Isaac being born. Abraham is 100 years old. We'll just go there quickly so you can see that. Genesis 21, and Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. And then, not only till we get to Genesis 22, where it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Uh, here, uh, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the, in the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and will, again, uh, and will come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. So think about this. This proves that James 2 is not talking about salvation by works or being justified by works because Abraham in James 2 was justified by works when he had offered his son Isaac upon the altar. But he offered his son Isaac upon the altar at least, you know, 13 years after he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. At least 13 years. But it would be more than that because when he offers Isaac his son upon the altar, how old is Isaac? Because remember, he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. But Isaac here is talking to Abraham. You're having a he, he's being able to reason with Abraham to say, hey, you know, we're going to give this offering, but, you know, where's the lamb? I mean, somebody that's Simon's age, you know, four or five years old, may not, even, not, may not understand that yet. But not only that, they're climbing up this mountain and Isaac is carrying wood on his back. I mean, I'm sure even Kevin's kids, they're pretty, pretty strong. But if you were to put wood on their back and climb up a mountain, they're not going to last very long. Um, so Isaac, I would say, I mean, he's at least, you know, a young teenager, I'd say. You know, but let's, let's be generous. Let's say he's 10 years old. But it's at least 23 years after Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness in Romans 4 that he's justified by works in James 2 when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. So you can see here that James 2 has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with showing your faith to God. Um, it has everything to do with your faith being profitable to other people, showing your faith to other men. And, you know, we see all the ages of Abraham through Genesis to show that he, in Romans 4, was justified before God in uncircumcision, which was many decades before he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. So James 2 is not showing us that works is an evidence of faith. Um, let's just go to Titus 1. <clears throat> Because this is, a, com this is a, from, a common passage where people try and say, well, your works do uh, show your faith, and your works do show your faith to God. 
Um, but I think if we compare it to James 2, we can, we can see that this passage, when compared to James 2, is just talking about your faith towards men. Look at verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So people that try and uh, make you know, works and evidence of faith or, or evidence of salvation, they'll go to this verse and they'll say, look, verse 15 says, you know, your works deny God. So your works are showing you that you don't believe on God. That's what they make that verse to me. Well, if we look at this verse in the context of James 2, we could also easily say that, well, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Well, who are they denying God to? Well, they, they could be denying God to other men. Because if you have a faith and you don't have works and you have sin in your life, your sin does deny God to other men um, if, if that's what you're doing. So your works do you know, accept or deny God by works towards men, but not towards God, because remember when we compare it to Romans 4, we can't glory before God. Now remember that question I asked you at the beginning. If works are a way that we determine whether or not we have faith, how much works do you need to have for this verse to, to apply to that principle? Because when we look at verse 15, it says, unto the pure all things are pure. So what's the standard that is set in this if you're going to use this as a way to determine whether or not you have faith? Well, it's the standard of perfection. Because if you're pure by your works, and that's how you have faith, well, it says unto the pure, if you're trying to make that mean saved people, it says all things are pure. Not some things are pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Not just some of their works, all of their works are reprobate. So what is this passage actually teaching? Well, first of all, if we were to read these couple of verses up here, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So I didn't read up further enough and up, up enough. But the context of Titus 1 is false prophets, first of all. And that's why false prophets, you know, these false prophets that are reprobate, this is the context in which these verses are being said. But the principle is still there, you know, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. So what is this verse actually talking about? Well, my opinion is that it's, it's another comparison of the old man and the new man. So we have the spirit and the flesh, the spirit that's born of God that cannot sin. We have the flesh that, is, um, you know, that sins, and that's why we have our sinful desires. We have the old man and the new man, the old man that is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and the new man that is created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, we see here now a contrast between the pure and the impure. So unto the pure, all things are pure, and unto the impure, you know, nothing is pure. So the way I interpret this verse is, well, it's a comparison between, again, the new creature and the old creature, the new man and the old man, uh, the spirit and the flesh. And, you know, this, this passage here, like we said, you know, if works is going to prove our faith to ourselves, then this passage wouldn't actually comfort me. This passage would condemn me. Because to me, not all things are pure. So if all things need to be pure for my faith to be existent by works, this verse is actually condemning me and showing me that I don't have faith if that's how I'm going to interpret it. All right, Matthew 7. Verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 
Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now this passage is often used to compliment James 2, to say, well, you see, James 2, if you don't have works, you have this dead faith. And this is what these people have here in verse 21, where they say, Lord, Lord, and they, they did call upon the Lord. They did have faith in Jesus, but they didn't have the works because Jesus said, you know, only those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, and the rest he's going to say, depart from me, uh, ye that work iniquity. So we see there, you know, if you're in sin, if you're still sinning, then, you know, Jesus is going to turn you away at the day of judgment. You know, and a couple of other things they say about this passage as well, when we read about the straight and the narrow way, they say, well, you know, the, it, they say the, str the gate is straight. So the gate is one, it's Jesus Christ. But then they say the way is narrow. So in order to get to that gate, you have to walk along this narrow way. And that's the narrow way of keeping the commandments and keeping the works. And again, you've got to ask yourself the question, well, if I'm on this narrow way by works, well, how much works do I need to have to make sure I'm on that narrow way? Well, if I have to be perfect to be on that narrow way, then who is on that narrow way? So, how do, so, so the narrow way is not talking about, about our works. Um, another thing that they say is, well, Jesus said here, ye shall know them by their fruits. And he says, a good tree brings forth good fruit, and a bad tree brings forth evil fruit. So they'll say, you'll know somebody, whether they're saved or not, by their fruit, and they make this fruit to mean their works. Now that sounds all good and well if you have some works in your life and you say, well, I'm a good tree, I've got some, some works. But the problem is we have sin as well. We have bad fruit in our life. So this verse, if we think it's going to comfort us and give us comfort and say, well, therefore you're saved, that's not what actually this verse will actually do to you if you actually take it to mean that. Because it says a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit in verse 18. So if you're technically a good tree, meaning you're a saved, born-again believer, and meaning you'll know whether or not you're a saved, born-again believer by your fruit, and, that, and meaning you're a good tree, therefore you've got the good fruit, well, then that means you won't have any bad fruit. But we do have bad fruit because the bad tree is there. So if we take this verse to mean, well, a good tree is a believer and a bad tree is an unbeliever, well, then by this standard, we're all unbelievers because we all have bad fruit. So isn't it funny that these verses that they go to to try and say, you know, this is how I know I have faith, this is how I know I'm saved, would actually condemn them because it's saying if you're a good tree and you're saved, then you shouldn't have any bad fruit. But we all have bad fruit. So that's not going to comfort them there. Um, so how do we understand this passage then? Um, what, what, what is the, the right interpretation of this passage? to line up what we see in the rest of the Bible, that salvation is by faith, and that works are not a good way to determine whether or not we have faith. Well, if we're talking about the straight and the narrow way in verse 13 and verse 14, remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the way is not necessarily a path that you walk in order to get to the gate. The way is Jesus. So if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then he said, you know, I am the door, right? If any man enter in by me, he shall be saved. So we're going by him, by the way, by the door. And a gate is another door, isn't it? So it's straight and narrow. Straight, S-T-R-A-I-T. 
meaning that there's there's not many options. Like it's uh, you know it's it's narrow, um, not straight as in and uh, not crooked. So the gate is straight and the and the way is narrow because there's only one way to be saved and that's through Jesus Christ. So that's how we understand that. Now, when it talks about the good trees and the bad trees, again, it's the context of false prophets. But we could still take that, that principle and say, well, yeah, okay, a good tree will bring forth good fruit and a bad tree will bring forth bad fruit. So how do we understand that in the context of a believer? Well, again, it's, it's, a, it's a, a comparison between the old man and the new man. Because I believe in us, we have both the bad tree, which is the flesh, and we have a good tree, which is the spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit, we'll have the fruit of the Spirit, we'll bring forth good fruit. But if we walk in the flesh, we'll have the works of the flesh and we'll bring forth bad fruit. So this is true in the sense that a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, but a Christian brings forth evil fruit because they have both the good tree and the bad tree. They have those two natures. But a false prophet doesn't have the true nature and a false prophet is reprobate. Uh, or in this, in this passage, a false prophet is reprobate. That's why he will only ever be a bad tree. Um, now, fruit as well in the Bible is not only your works. I mean, fruit can also be the things that you say. Uh, let me show you here in Hebrews um, 13, 15. It says here, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Um, there's another, I won't turn there for sake of time, but if you actually compare the, um, in Luke, I believe, with the, 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 the Matthew 7 chapter where he says, a good tree cannot bring forth good fruit and an evil tree cannot bring forth, um, oh, I'm getting that mixed up, but you know what I mean. So the good tree has to bring forth good fruit, a bad tree will bring forth bad fruit. When you look at that parable in Luke, and I'll just find it quickly because I want to show you guys. I wasn't planning to turn there, but um, I just want to show you guys. Let me just find it quickly. In Luke. Yeah. So I think this is a parable. I, I'm not 100% sure if, if Jesus is preaching this at the exact same time or it's another sermon, but preaching on the same topics. But look here, it says, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good... Oh, yeah. So th there's, that, there's that passage there, right, that we saw in Matthew 7 talking about the good tree and the bad tree, bringing forth good fruit and evil fruit. So we see that same thing there in Luke 6, 43 and 44. But look at what he says in verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So I think it's interesting there that it puts that same parable of the good tree and the bad tree bringing forth good fruit, bringing forth evil fruit, and then exactly afterward, it's talking about the things that you say. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So in Matthew 7, is it talking about our works? You know, possibly, maybe not. Is it talking about our converts, you know, our, our, the fruit that we win to Christ? I mean, that, that, that's one way you can interpret Matthew 7, because you could say, you know, you know a false prophet by his disciples. If his disciples are, are, are devils or, you know, uh, these fornicating, you know, unclean false prophets, probably the person that's teaching them, that won them to Christ, is also a false prophet. But I personally believe that the right interpretation of Matthew 7 is the things that we say. So we see in Hebrews, we have fruit of our lips, we see here that, you know, you bring forth good fruit and then right after he says that you will bring forth good treasure out of the um, treasure of your heart. I didn't plan to go here, but I just wanted to show you one more verse because I thought this would be interesting. Uh, in James, I think it's James 2, no, James 3. Remember in James 3, it talks about our speech, right? Be not many masters, for we offend all in speech, 
It talks about the tongue not being tamed. So the, so the passage here is about what we say, the things that we talk about. But remember what it says here in uh, verse 11 and 12. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? So there's again this talking like saying that our ma the things we say is like a fountain. So we shouldn't bring forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. But look here, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees, either of vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and, f and um, fresh. So it's interesting there that the fruit of our mouth sort of lines up with what's saying here. It's saying, you know, you take fruit from one tree that's, you know, olives, and you take fruit from grapes from a vine. So it, it's almost like that same good treasure and evil treasure, good tree, bad tree. The fruit is the words that we, that we say. Anyway, some, something to think about. So I thought that was, um, that was a bit of a rabbit trail, but it, that might be interesting to you. That, that's my take on Matthew 7 with the fruit um, being good fruit and bad fruit. It's the things that they say. And that's why you can not profit by their fruit because it's what they say because it doesn't matter how clean they look. They might have the works, right? You know, maybe they have people that are saved that are following them. You know, we see that today, churches that are preaching a false gospel, but there are saved people in that church. You know, like for the ch Catholic church, for example, some Catholics are saved, but what is the Pope and all these bishops and priests preaching? They're all preaching work salvation, preaching that Jesus isn't really the Son of God, that the Bible isn't true. So how do we know them? We don't know them by their cleanliness because a lot of them are clean. A lot of them are living a clean life. Uh, maybe some of even their converts are, pre are, are professing that they believe on Jesus Christ and he's the only saviour. But we know they're a false prophet because of their fruit, because of the, their preaching and their preaching lies, their preaching heresy. That's how we identify these bad trees and these false prophets. Um, not by their works because often or not, you know, they have good works. I mean, think of the scribes and the Pharisees. They were right. Except your righteousness should exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So they were righteous people, but that's why Jesus warned them, you'll know them by their fruits, um, by the things that they say. Now, what about this last bit in here that says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Um, and I missed verse 21, but it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. A couple of things to point out in this passage here is, number one, you know, making Jesus your Lord is not what gets you saved first of all. So just because they're saying, Lord, Lord, I mean, that's not what gets you saved. You need to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, that sounds like you have to do works in order to enter into heaven. But let's compare this with uh, John 6, verse 38. Jesus says here in John 6, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. At the last day. So what is the will of God? That everyone that seeth the Son will believe on him. So we can take that verse in Matthew 7 and understand it that it's not whosoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven, meaning that we are keeping the works, but that we believe on the Son. But even another way you could interpret this passage is when we believe on Jesus Christ, righteousness is imputed unto us. And that's why God can say that we're doing His will because when we're born again and we don't sin, we are keeping the will of God. And that's how we can understand a lot of other passages too, that we are counted as righteous, not by our works, but by our faith. And that's why we can enter into the kingdom of God by doing the will of, Father, will of the Father, whether or not it's believing on Jesus Christ or whether or not it's doing the works because we do both in Jesus Christ. Now many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work 
iniquity. Now we taught, we said that you know, calling Jesus Lord is not what saves you. It's not making Jesus your Lord that saves you. It is believing on Jesus Christ and making him your saviour. Savior. And we can see here in this passage that these people that are coming to Jesus, they're not people that called upon the Lord and didn't have the works. They are people that, call, that, that were calling him Lord and were trusting their works to be saved. Because look what happens when they face Jesus. What do they say to the Jesus? They say, have we not prophesied in thy name, verse 22, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now, if you stood before Jesus and Jesus said to you, why should I let you into heaven? If you're saved, if you're trusting him as your savior, is the first thing, first thing you're going to say is, look at my wonderful works. No, right? The first thing you're going to say is, well, I believed on you. You know, I trusted you as you say, I, I believed on you and your word said that I have everlasting life. Why am I being turned away? But is that what these people are saying? These people aren't saying that. What they're saying is, look at all my works. I've prophesied in thy name. In thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. So these were people that did make Jesus their Lord, but they didn't make Jesus their Savior. And that's why he's turned them away. So this passage is not talking about your works being an evidence of your faith or, you know, if you can believe and if you don't have works, you don't really believe. Because these are people that were trusting their works, not trusting Jesus Christ. And if we were to take this passage to try and comfort us to say, hey, well, I'm a good tree, it would actually condemn you if you think that good tree is a believer as a whole. Because it says here an evil tree um, will bring forth bad fruit and a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. All right, let me just turn to one more and then we'll finish. I just want to go to 1 John chapter 3, I believe it is, the one I want to go to. And I'll just finish on 1 John because 1 John, if you read through 1 John, I think is the most abused um, book when it comes to this whole idea of works proving your faith. And there are, you know, to, to be honest, I think there are a lot of hard verses in there that do sort of start to allude to that. Um, and before I just hit John 3, let, let me just uh, go to um, a couple really quick. First uh, John 2. Here's one of them. And, and, and as we read through this verse, just remember that question in the beginning that I asked was, if works shows that you're saved, how much works do you need in order for this verse to mean that? Because if you read through these verses, the verses that they're using to try and say, well, this is how I know I'm saved. I mean, I read these verses and if I took it that way, it would mean I'm not saved or I'm not understanding it the way they are. Or if I did understand it the way they are, it's not showing me that I'm saved. Look at this one. Hereby we do know that we know him. So it's saying, oh, here, see, if you're saved, you know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, if somebody <laughs> preaches that verse and says, well, you're in sin, you're not in church, you're not soul winning, therefore you don't know God. Well, then why is the bar set there at soul winning and church and reading? Like, why is the bar not perfection like we saw before? If you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. So <laughs> how, how can I take this verse and say, well, I know God because of my works, because I don't keep all the commandments. So therefore, this verse would actually mean, as, if I take it as a Christian as a whole, would mean that I don't know God and that I am a liar because I say, I say I know God, but I'm not keeping all the commandments. So this is not how we interpret these verses because if we did, it would condemn all of us because none of us then would know God. All of us would be liars if we know God, meaning we're a believer, but, but we're still sinning. So as we go through a couple of these other verses, we, we have to understand that there is a new man and that there is an old man. And I believe John, 1 John is not a book trying to give you evidence of your faith. I believe it's a book talking about the difference between the old man and the new man and how we differentiate between the two. But because we have both, um, 
Some of them, they apply to us, but not in the complete sense of the entire Christian. Uh, look at this, another one. Uh, oh, not that one, sorry. Um, 28. And now, little children, verse 28, abide in him that when, ye shall, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So they say, ah, see, there you go. If you believe, you're going to do righteousness. Well, again, remember, well, how much righteousness do I need in order to know I'm born of him? If I'm determining whether or not I'm righteous by my works, because I sin still. So am I born of God? If that's the way I'm going to interpret that verse. Uh, and you know, John 3 is like the, the nail in the coffin. How this, this John cannot be talking about, you know, proving your salvation by works. I mean, look at what it says in 1 John 3. Uh, let's read from verse 4. Who co whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression, transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. So this is not saying that you're, you're, you're only going to sin a little. This is saying that if you abide in Christ, you're not sinning at all. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the, de for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. So not only do you not sin, you're not even capable of sinning, if you take this verse to mean a Christian, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So think about it. If we were to take this verse to mean, well, we prove whether or not we say whether, whether we sin or not, I mean, this, this verse, according to that interpretation, is going to prove that everyone is of the devil and nobody is born of God. So what is the right interpretation of the, this verse in context with the rest of the Bible? Well, again, it's the new creature, isn't it? It's the new man and the old man, the good tree and the bad tree. This is showing you that the good tree, the new man, the, the new creature that is born of God does not sin, that spirit that dwells in us, and then we have the flesh, which I believe is of the devil. And that is not born of God. That doesn't do righteousness. Um, and that's why we commit sin. So it's a comparison of the two. It's not saying, well, if you sin, you're saved. Or you're not saved. And if you don't sin, uh, you, you are saved. Some people will try and say, well, it's saying here that, you know, not that you commit sin, but it's just a lifestyle of sin. But that's not what this verse is saying. I mean, you read it. It's not, it, it, is it alluding to a lifestyle of sin? It's saying that you can't, it's not possible that you even sin at all um, because you're born of God. So we can't just change this passage to mean what we want it to mean just because we want to use our works as an evidence of, of salvation or an evidence of faith. So we saw a lot of verses, and, and the way I believe we understand them is the new man and the old man, and that's why they're such extremes. Keep the commandments, or otherwise you're condemned. You know, you either have good tree or you have a good fruit or bad fruit. You either sin or you don't, because these two natures are there that we have, and we have both of them. And so we need to understand these verses in the context of that doctrine. Now, somebody might ask a question after listening to this sermon and say, "Well, you know, Victor." Aren't you, aren't you just, I mean, you, these verses are pretty clear that you need works in order to be saved. Aren't you just twisting scripture to, to make it fit what you believe? Well, you know, in a sense I am, because that's what we need to do in order to harmonize all scripture. We need to understand scripture, because the Bible says, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we have to take into account all scripture. We don't twist it. You know, we, 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 make, we know exactly what it says. The question is, do we have the right understanding of it in light of all the other scriptures? Because, yeah, God's word can be understood one way or another, but we make sure we have the right understanding when we compare all of scripture. I remember me and Michael, we were talking to this lady 
and um, she was going on about Calvinism and saying, oh, you know, there are verses that allude to Calvinism. And I said, well, there, there are verses that sound like Calvinism. But, you know, we need, to, we need to take a verse and we need to take all of Scripture and then we need to decide which, which position is the sound position taking all Scripture into account. And if we take all Scripture into account, we can see that the verses that allude to Calvinism can be explained another way and then that lines them up with the other scriptures we see that contradict Calvinism. So that's why I would want to take that position because I can harmonize all the scripture and get a meaning that is consistent across all the Bible rather than pulling one verse out. I mean, we saw that example in James, right? If we just take James chapter 2 out and say, faith without works is dead, and we take the position, well, if you don't have works, you're not saved, well, that is obviously the wrong interpretation with the rest of the Bible. So we are misunderstanding James 2 if we take that interpretation because we have not taken all Scripture into account and made a sound position with what the Scripture is teaching as a whole. That's how we get a sound doctrine. But another question you might ask is, you know, well, when we look at these passages in John chapter 4, and if, if works... Righteousness and unrighteousness is a way to see the good, the new man and the old man. Well, then you've got to ask the question, well, why can't works be an evidence of, of your salvation, right? Because if evidence is, is ev if works is evidence of the new man, couldn't works then be an evidence of salvation? Am I making sense, right? Because I'm saying, okay, works doesn't prove that, that, that you're saved. But if works shows that you have a new man, how then can... Why then can't it act as evidence of salvation? Well, the reason, number one, the reason why I think it's bad is because you can have both. You're not going to really have assurance if you base it solely on your works because you can have both. Now, does, um, you know, does works prove that the new man is there? Well, yes, but because in Romans 4, a person can believe and not have works, somebody technically could be believed but left wondering, you know, how much works do I need to have before I'm confident the new man is there. You know, so th there's that uncertainty of, well, I, have, I might have works, but do I have enough to assure myself that the new man is there if works is an evidence of the new man and therefore could act as evidence of salvation? Well, possibly, but, but here's a thought. Um, Hebrews 11. We read here, in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Um, let me show you another verse in Romans 14. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith, is sin. So the thought I had is, okay, well, if the new man does righteousness, and let's say, you know, you want to be able to use those works to prove that the new man is there, but you, you still have to go through this one step. And I, I hope I, I, it's not really clear in my mind, so I hope I'm explaining it to you guys as clear as I believe it is in my mind. How do you even determine whether works are good works? Because what makes works true good works. Well, according to the Bible, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You know, it, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you still have to determine whether your work, that work to be evidence of the new creature is done in faith. So we're back to square one, right? We're back to the same problem. Well, how do I know whether I'm doing it in faith? Because I might be doing works, I might be in church, but I, is that the, the work that is required to show me that the new man is there? Because the old man can sit in church. The old man can read a book. You know, the old man can talk to somebody that they can't see. Um, so are we doing it, the good works that will show us that the new man is there? Well, the way we determine the good works of the new man is because the good works are done in faith, right? So, you know, even if somebody says, well, you know, isn't works evidence of the new creature? Well, to determine whether those works are even good works, we need to go back to our original question which is, how do I know I believe? Because we have to determine whether or not we're doing these works in faith. So let's close with this. 
you know, so what, so what is the evidence of faith, right? Because we, we started talking about the question, you know, if we, if we believe we're saved, or how do I know I believe? So I showed you a lot of ways how you do not determine that you believe. So that leaves us with the question, well, then, then what is the evidence of faith? How do I know I believe? And the answer is a lot simpler than you think. You know you have faith because you know you have faith. And what do I mean by that? It's because you know what you believe. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need evidence of faith because you can see your faith. So, you know, we talked about, you know, believing means that you accept something to be true. Um, you know what you believe. That's why when somebody says, how do I know I believe? They're looking for evidence outside of faith. But you don't need evidence for something you see. Right? Um, you know, that's why it's only possible to lie to somebody else because I don't see what you believe right like I don't know what Elizabeth is thinking um, she doesn't know what I'm thinking that's why I can lie to her because I could lie to her because I could say something that I'm not actually believing in my head but if Elizabeth could read my mind I can no longer lie to her can I because if I say something and she could read my mind then she knows I'm lying. I can't lie to her anymore because she knows what I'm going to say before I even say it. And if I say something different to what I'm believing, then I can't lie to her. Now that's why I believe you can't lie to yourself. Because, you could, yes, you could believe something that is a lie and be deceived, so you could deceive yourself. You know, like you could think you're a great Christian and you're not a great Christian, and, but you're thinking you're a great Christian. You're not lying to yourself. You're not knowing that you're not a great Christian, but telling yourself you're a great Christian. You're just believing that a lie, which is, you know, this is what makes you a good Christian, and you've applied it to yourself. So you can't lie to yourself because you know what you believe. So you can't at the same time believe something is a lie, but also accept it as truth because you know what you're believing. You know whether you've accepted it as truth or whether you haven't accepted it by truth, uh, as truth. Um, so that's why you don't need evidence for your faith, because you can see it. That's why God doesn't need evidence of Abraham's faith in Romans 4. He's not glorying before God, because God can see his faith. He doesn't need evidence to prove his faith. But if he's going to need to prove his faith to other men, therefore that's when the works comes in, and he's trying to show his faith to other men. But even at the end of the day, it doesn't prove that your faith is there, because you can do works without faith. So I hope that's making sense. So, so why did I name the sermon, you know, the evidence of salvation? Because I, you know, I call it the evidence of salvation, but we've been talking about the evidence of faith. Well, because you can see faith, you don't need evidence of faith, right? Because you can see it. But when we talk about the evidence of salvation, I don't know if this is groundbreaking for you or whether you've realized I'm coming to this conclusion. But Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So salvation is what we don't see. What is the evidence of salvation? Faith is the evidence. Now why is it foolish to, to ask the question, well, how do I know I believe when it's something you can see? Because then we delve into the question, well, what's the evidence of faith? But that's a foolish question because evidence doesn't have evidence. If that makes sense. If something is evidence, it doesn't need evidence of that evidence. Does that mean? Let, let me give an example. Like let's say, let's say I own a car and you guys haven't seen the car, right? So now you're believing, do I have the car? And I say, well, these keys, and, and this analogy is not perfect, but let's say, you know, these keys are evidence that I own a car. Right? Because why would I have car keys if I didn't own a car? Well, I, I could have, you know, this is where the analogy fails because technically, you know, I could have keys and not own a car, right? But the, the analogy fails there because God says if you have the keys, you have a car, right? Because he says if you believe, you have eternal life. So that's how we get our assurance. So if I have keys, according to the analogy of faith and salvation, if I have keys, that proves I have a car because this is the evidence that I have the car. So faith is the evidence. Now, do I need evidence to prove to you that I have keys? No, right? Because you're seeing the keys. 
So why would I need evidence to prove to you that I have the evidence of the car when you're seeing the evidence which is the keys? Does that make sense? So that's why it's silly to ask the question, well, what is the evidence of faith? Because faith is the evidence. Faith is the evidence that you have salvation. So it's silly to ask the question, what is the evidence of faith? Because you don't need evidence for something that you can see. And we can see our faith. We know what we believe. That's why we know that we're saved. And the reason why people doubt their salvation based on whether or not they have faith is because they are giving faith an evidence that is not an evidence of faith. Do you know what I mean? So we talked about the evidence of faith and they're giving them the circumstances, feelings, emotions, desires, works. But these are not evidence of faith because faith doesn't require evidence because you can see your faith. That's why faith is the evidence for salvation because faith is what you can see to prove what you can't see, which is eternal life, which is salvation. So let's just end on this thought. You know, it's funny because, you know, that's what it's like with doctrine often times sometimes the answer is so simple because the answer really is simple right i mean i could have just said to you at the beginning well we, we know that we're saved because we believe and faith is the evidence but sometimes what complicates the truth is false doctrine you know false doctrine makes the truth complicated but at the end of the day um, truth is is really simple